So good morning and thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. This is a topic that is very near and dear to me. I really enjoy learning about this, researching enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS because everything has to have a sexy acronym now. It can't just be initials anymore. We can't say Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's KFC, right? Same thing, so. We'll talk about a couple things. We'll talk about what ERAS is. We'll talk about some strategies of how you do it. Bear in mind that ERAS is something that is customizable to your institution, to your situation. There's not just one way to do it, so you want to think about what works for your situation, but I'll tell you a little bit about what works in our situation, or at least in one of our situations. And we'll talk a little bit about implementation as well. I'm going to say it's not working. Oh, there we are. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you. That's Max. Max is my youngest. This isn't on a loop. I think it goes for minutes and minutes. I don't know what possessed him that day. <laughs> so why do we want to embark on this journey of ERAS? What's the big deal? So we talk about different things. We talk about reduced length of stay. That's an easy one to measure. Administrators like it because they can look at it and it can be correlated to things like cost and outcomes and things like that. As healthcare professionals, honestly, we don't care that much about that. Reduce complications, that's good for everybody, right? Because it reduces the cost of the care. It makes us look better on surveys. But the reality of it is that for us as folks in healthcare, this means that patients do better. And that's why we went into this. We didn't go into it to make spreadsheets look better. We went into it to make people feel better, do better, give them the best opportunity for success we can. So that's a big deal for us, is reducing the complications. Reducing healthcare costs, that's good for everybody, because let's be honest, healthcare is too expensive. How can we fix it? How can we make it better? And doing these first two things helps with this one. Patients don't care about any of this. Patients care about this one. They want to get back to their normal life. They want to get back to doing the things they enjoy, going back to work, taking care of their families. This is what patients care about, and enhanced recovery after surgery helps us achieve that goal. When you go to conferences on enhanced recovery after surgery, you will see this slide over and over and over. I forget who first put it out, but it's like many things in medicine. Once somebody puts it out there, it just gets repeated over and over again. It looks really complicated. This is really scary. You mean I have to do all this stuff by myself on top of my clinical duties, on top of my family life, on top of everything else? You want me to do all this? That's not going to happen. So whenever I see something like this that you know, intimidates me and things like that, I say, wow, this is really scary. I don't want to go through that gate. You know, how do I take this first step, right? It's a big jump. You get the other thing, too. Why are we experimenting? I've never had a problem in put in the number 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, whatever. Who's heard that one before, right? I've never had a problem. Why are you telling me to change it now? So it's, there's a lot of inertia. And, there's, and it's, again, it's scary. You're not used to it. You're out of residency as a physician like me. You're out of residency. You feel like, I don't have time to learn new things now. I'm not, you know, some people are just not interested in learning new things. So I try to couch it to myself in a different way. I, I try to relate it to things I know. So when I started down this pathway, I asked myself, what does Tom love? Well, I love grilled meat. <laughs> that doesn't apply, though. I've been known to enjoy beer. Again, not sure how that implies to, applies to enhanced recovery after surgery, but... I love my kooky family. I can tell you that this is an old picture, because this one, that's Max, who was dancing, and this is Xander's, my older boy. He's actually the same height as her now. So, this is an old picture. I forget exactly how long ago. But perhaps, except for the kooky family, most of all, I love cars. And I love all kinds of cars. But most of all, I love race cars. I think race cars are great. I think they're beautiful, they're loud, they're fast. You can express your, your individuality with them a little bit. I love that it has a gold tooth. <laughs> For years and years, my mom had a gold tooth in the front of her mouth. We called it her pimp tooth. We were, we were a little disappointed when she got rid of it. But I really, really love racing. 
I enjoy watching racing with my boys. I love going to races. But racing is not just about the drivers. You will find people who make that mistake all the time. I have a cardiac surgeon that we work with sometimes who once tried to explain that cardiac surgery is like a Formula One pit stop and he is the driver. Now, why did he say that? He said it because he's the center of attention, right? That's what he was trying, I think, to get at. I would say he's mistaken, although you can't tell him that because he's always right, just ask him. <laughs> the fact is the driver is one component of the team, but behind every driver there is an enormous team of engineers, mechanics, IT people. This is the Red Bull racing team. Look at all this data they're looking at. This is during a race. Cars are going around a track at 200 miles an hour and these guys are looking at all these numbers. And by the way, this isn't even the whole trailer that looks at data. One of the Formula One teams, a team called McLaren out of England, they were the first to do wireless data transmission through from the racetrack all the way back to England to analyze. It was terabytes of data for you guys who are, who are IT people. You know how much that is and it was done wirelessly. It was the first time it was ever done. So there's a lot of science, a lot of data that goes into this stuff. It is not just about the driver. It's a team effort, team. And races are not won by huge margins. They're not won by miles and miles or minutes. They're won by not even seconds, tenths, tenths of seconds. This is Road America. This is a racetrack in Wisconsin that my family and I like to go to. We've got a lot of good memories here. And how do you win a race? You don't zip ahead of everybody, like I said. You gain a tenth of a second here through the carousel. Coming up the hill here, you gain maybe a mile or two an hour over your competitors. You make yourself a couple of tenths of a second at a pit stop. By the way, that's shot in real time. That's the world record for a pit stop in Formula One. That was four tires in 1.88 seconds. I'm going to change four tires this afternoon on my car to put on my winter tires. It's going to take me all afternoon. <laughs> and these guys did it in 1.88 seconds. And the week before, actually, they had broken the world record at 1.91 seconds. So they did even better this time around. Sorry for the digits there, or the pixels. But the point is, it's not one thing. It is what I like to refer to as the accumulation of small gains. This is the 2003 Firestone Indy Lights. Four across at the end. Look at the margin of victory here. Okay? Four across. It was really exciting to watch. But that's my point. And this is different than the way I was trained. And this is probably different than the way you were trained. We were all trained, what do you do in medicine? You change one thing at a time, you measure it, and then you see which thing made the difference, right? The silver bullets are gone. We've shot them all. It's done. It's all about the accumulation of small gains now. So this is the attitude I want you to remember and think about as we go forward. This is a definition I had found on what is enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS. I like it a lot. You're well-educated people. I never like going to conferences where somebody reads the slides to me. It drives me nuts. So I'm not going to read it to you. But I am going to draw your attention to two words, multidisciplinary and standardized. These are two words that are going to be important to remember as we go forward during this conversation and as you go through your own ERAS efforts. We'll talk about phases of care. We're going to break it down a little bit as we go forward. We'll talk about what we're going to be doing pre-op for patients, what we're doing intraoperatively, and what we're, we're doing to do post-operatively. So that'll help to organize it in your mind. I tend to call these things pathways, not protocols. Why? Because I don't want anybody to feel headlocked into doing it a certain way. You have to understand that while I did tell you we're going to standardize it, be prepared that there are going to be times where there are patients who fall off the pathway for a variety of reasons. I have never adopted that whole everyone is different mantra. That's not true. If everyone was different, then there's no way we could do medicine, right? Because we do medicine based on populations, based on we expect certain responses to surgeries, procedures, medications, whatever. Everyone is not different. My, I always tell people, most people are the same. Some people are different. Okay? So that's the attitude I want you to have there is, it's a pathway. Don't use the word protocol because then people get defensive. Why do I have to do it this way? This patient has this issue or that issue. Be prepared to come off the pathway if you need to, but remember, this is the suggested pathway. Why don't you try and do it this way? I will not come to your house and put you in a headlock. Even those two knuckleheads probably deserved it that day. 
So preoperatively, what do we talk about? Some of the issues are going to be setting expectations, and this is going to happen in the office when you first meet patients. We're going to talk about prehabilitation. We're going to talk about carbohydrate loading before surgery, and we're going to talk about acetaminophen. So let's, let's start down that pathway there. Setting expectations. Somebody once told me discharge starts before admission, right? It's similar, even if it's an outpatient procedure, we want to set expectations. Be realistic with patients. This was a problem for us initially when we were doing some of our ERAS efforts because you get some surgeons who are less focused on, uh, well, how do I put it, outcomes and more focused on volume. Okay, it's a natural thing, especially if you're, if you're paid by production. It's a natural thing. I find it funny that in the garment industry we decided that paying people by the piece is inhumane, but in medicine I get paid by the patient. It's kind of funny, whatever. Be realistic with them. Don't tell them it's not gonna hurt, you're gonna be fine, it's no big deal. Tell them the truth. Tell them what to expect. If you tell them it's not gonna hurt, it's gonna be fine, it's no big deal, that's what they expect. If you tell them you're gonna be sore, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt, but we're gonna help you, then they're mentally prepared for that, and that's important. Expectations of what you want them to be doing physically after surgery, you want them up and moving. Your bed is not a good place after surgery. After surgery, you need to be up and moving. Start setting those expectations before the patient has their operation. Talk about when you expect them to get back to their daily activities. Reduce chronic opioid use prior to surgery. This goes under setting expectations because we want to have this conversation with patients. This is a big deal in the media right now, right? But it, it, not just in the media, it is a big deal, period. Chronic opioid use before surgery is definitely going to increase your risk and your opportunity for complications postoperatively, including readmissions. Okay, so you really want to have this conversation with patients. You get the patients, this one always, even before we started talking about chronic opioid use, this one always got me. You'd meet patients and on their medication list would be like Norco. Why do you take Norco? I don't know, I just take it. Who just takes Norco? <laughs> and yet they're out there, these people are out there, and we need to help them. And some of this is manufactured by the healthcare community. Frankly, we did this to people to some degree. So you can, you can see here what, you know, what I mentioned in terms of some of the complications and concerns you have on the patient who's coming for surgery, who's taking pre-op opioids already. So don't take that one on, on your own. Involve their chronic pain physician, involve addiction medicine. These are resources that are out there to help you to help these patients. When I made this, lecture a few weeks ago. I didn't think about the fact that the Chicago Marathon was this weekend. It was tomorrow. Anybody running it? Ah, oh, come on, come on. So it ends up being kind of nice that it worked out that way, though. So when you go to the marathon, you don't just walk up and put on your number and just start running, right? You train. You get ready. But what do we do with patients? Doesn't matter what state they're in, we sign them up for surgery and we bring them for an operation. Some small, some big. But we just bring them for surgery. I would argue with you that having an operation, particularly an invasive one, but any surgery, is no different a physiologic perturbation than running 26.2 miles. I can tell you, I ran this once. I can tell you, I got to that 26th mile and then saw that the finish line was still two tenths of a mile around the corner and I invented new cuss words. I was so mad. I was so mad. But you can't take patients who are not in the best shape possible and just throw them into the surgical experience. They need to train. They need to get ready for it. So we talk about prehab. I don't need them to look like Arnold, but what we want to do is we want to buff them up a little bit. We want to get away from this concept of, uh, you know, they're just poor protoplasm. What can you do? There's a lot you can do. It's not an emergent surgery. A lot of your surgeries are not going to be emergent. They're going to be elective. So take the time. Have these patients start exercising. It doesn't have to be weightlifting and Mr. Olympia and I'm going to show my age, P90X. It can be walking 20 minutes a day, twice a day. When you're sedentary and you're just on the couch, Walking 20 minutes a day, twice a day is going to give you a lot of cardio. There was one lecture where I was at a couple of weeks ago where they talked about giving people resistance bands, having them do resistance exercises, which is a great idea. In fact, the guy said, he's like, you can get them on a roll and you can even get the name of your institution printed on them for like nothing. It's like 20 cents a piece or something like that. But it's great because it gets them to start exercising. It gets them to start building up 
their cardiac and their pulmonary status and make them have a better opportunity for a good outcome. Smoking cessation, this is a big one. Smoking, and I should have probably added vaping as well, but you know, whatever. Smoking cessation, wound healing, around the time of an anesthetic, you know, we talk about the carbon monoxide levels being an issue. Really more importantly, it does put them at some pulmonary risks, especially if you're doing like a laparoscopic procedure. They're gonna tend to have coughing postoperatively. They're gonna, you put you at risk for rupturing sutures and things like that. Smoking cessation is good for all these patients. Reduction in alcohol intake as well, helps them nutritionally, helps you to make sure you don't, you're not dealing with any kind of addiction issues before you come for surgery. I like to think of surgery as a teachable moment, and I come back to this a lot with patients. You're coming for an operation, it's a big deal. I never tell patients it's not a big deal, it's a big deal. We wanna make you as good as we can so that you can do well after, during your surgery and after. So I use it as a teachable moment. Quit smoking, start exercising, lose some weight. This is a good opportunity. Some patients are nervous around their surgery. They wanna do well, they wanna succeed. They're nervous about having a complication. Help them to get through the surgical period successfully, but also to make good long-term changes in their lives. Preoperative nutrition is huge. You will get people who are obese, and actually, even though they're big, they're still nutritionally deficient. So body weight is not an indicator of nutritional status. You get the little stick people, they're little, you turn sideways, you can't see them around anymore, right, you know those types? And they may be nutritionally fine, or they may not be. We get bigger people and we make jokes, right? Oh, how can they be malnourished? Look at them, right? Because, you know, we get bitter. We're, we're in healthcare. We're, that's what we're like. Somebody told me in healthcare, everyone is dead on the inside and alcoholic on the outside. <laughs> I'd like to think we're not quite that bad, but, you know, the, the point is well taken. We have 75% of surgeons on one survey who said that nutrition is important, but only 20% of the time do you have any kind of screening process available to you. So we all think it's important, but then we don't do anything about it. That's, that's silly. You can do nutrition screening in your office. You can do albumin levels pre-op. We use a simple three-question screening tool. We have Epic at Edward Hospital that we use. Uh, we have a, a tool that we built in there that can be uh, administered by a nurse or an MA. It's three questions and then it automatically generates a consult if they score a certain score to dietary, or to our dietitians rather, and then they follow up with the patient. The dietitians at Edward have been fabulous. I cannot tell you how great they've been to work with. The first time I called them up, it was the funniest thing. They were so excited that somebody called them. I think the phone probably never rings. <laughs> So they were so happy to have something to do, but the truth is they're great allies. And this is a big deal, okay? You get patients buffed up before surgery, and there was one study where they said for every dollar that you spend pre-op on nutrition, you're gonna save $52 on the, on the post-surgical side. I read that study, and it, they're quoting another study, so I went and found that study. It's a little optimistic. But the fact is they're right, that you can make patients be nutritionally more replete and give them a better opportunity for wound healing to do better postoperatively. So let's get back to the marathon again here for a minute. So you go to run the marathon. Who shows up for the marathon NPO? Nobody, right? I'm gonna run 26 miles, I'm gonna do it on an empty stomach. What do they do? They eat all this pasta the night before. The morning they get up, they have something, something light and sensible to eat, but they eat something, right? How can we make patients NPO for hours and hours before surgery? I just told you that surgery is no smaller physiologic perturbation than running the marathon. So why do we treat them this way? We wouldn't do this if we were running the marathon. But that's what we do, isn't it kind of fun? So carbohydrate loading. Look at how happy he is. You know why he's so happy? Because somebody told me he could drink Gatorade before his surgery. He doesn't have to be NPO anymore. Why do we do carbohydrate loading? So people thought when I started this program with the carbohydrate loading, and I'll say Gatorade, I don't have any particular allegiance to it. We use Gatorade because it's cheap, it's easily available, it's not confusing for patients. Um, you can use any carbohydrate rich drink you want. There are certain ones out there that claim certain benefits because of the type of carbs that are in there. there I'll tell you the truth, there's no studies that say that one is better than the other. So I'll put that out there. If I say Gatorade, I'm not trying to push for a particular product. So why do we do this? It's not about the fluids, it's about the carbs. So remember that, because then I get people who say to me, what if I just drink water? I don't like Gatorade. 
Can you get the cucumber lime like this one is? It's funny how they have regional flavors. I've never seen cucumber lime here. But nonetheless, you want the carbs. It makes patients feel more comfortable. As soon as you tell somebody they cannot eat or drink, what happens? I am so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. I tell my kids, my kids don't get this, and sometimes I'll say to them, oh yeah? Don't touch your face. They can't help it. They need to touch their face. As soon as you tell somebody you can't do something, they have to do it. So it makes them more comfortable. It decreases post-op nausea vomiting post-operatively. Even if you're doing a small procedure, like in an ASC setting, what holds patients up? Post-op nausea vomiting is a big thing that will keep patients longer in recovery. It will even sometimes cause admissions, right? If you're dealing with a, a female population, they already have increased risks for nausea and vomiting postoperatively. They just do. That's the things that put you at risk for nausea and vomiting just generically. Female gender, young, non-smokers, things like that. So this is one way to modify those risk factors. I always tease the smokers because smoking actually reduces the risk for post-op nausea vomiting. I tell them smoking is good for two things. It's good for post-op nausea vomiting, and it's good for schizophrenics. They seem to do better when they smoke. So I ask them, which one are you? <laughs> it decreases insulin resistance. This is a funny one, right? Because when we hear insulin, we all think automatically what? Diabetic, sugars, right? That's all we think of insulin. Insulin is a very complicated hormone. We don't understand it sometimes as, as medical professionals who are not endocrinologists. Insulin is also an anabolic hormone. So if we want to go back to that picture of Arnold that we saw earlier, insulin causes your body to not break down its own proteins and to build up its own proteins, which is what you need postoperatively, right? When you have surgery, you have the breakdown of your own proteins, and we want to try to minimize that. When patients are NPO, they come, their glycogen stores in their liver are depleted. That's why we eat breakfast in the morning, right? It's, you're breaking the fast. Your liver is depleted. You eat to replenish it. So that's what we're doing is we're giving them carbs to replenish their glycogen stores. It makes their liver replete. It takes them out of what we call a starvation mode. So now when they suffer an injury, a controlled injury, surgery is controlled injury, they're not as prone to break down their own proteins. Instead, what they do is they maintain their proteins and continue building to repair their bodies. So I mentioned sugars and I mentioned diabetics, right? It is a knee-jerk reaction in medicine. Diabetics cannot have sugar, right? It's the same knee-jerk reaction we have with renal failure patients. You can't give them water. Well, why not? Because they're in renal failure. Don't you still have to drink water? Well, yeah, but they're in renal failure. Nobody has a good answer. They just automatically know you're not supposed to give them fluids. That's not true. Diabetics also need carbohydrates just to function in life, right? You just have to be careful about it. You have to monitor them, but they still need them. There's not a ton of literature on doing carb loading in diabetics. Okay, so it's a little bit of a black, or a, a black box or a question mark. It is hard to convince people that this is okay. It's a in, in a Gatorade, it's 25 grams of sugar in a 12-ounce uh, bottle, which is what we tell them to drink at our institution. We'll get to that later. So we do it in everybody, including diabetics. I can tell you we have not had rampant hyperglycemia. And when you have patients whose hemoglobin A1C is well controlled, they're like seven or eight, it doesn't happen. We had one cancellation in a year, because I went through all the charts last year, who came in at 550 with a hemoglobin A1C of like 12. That ain't Gatorade, okay? <laughs> that ain't Gatorade. So even though there's still some question marks, we load all the diabetics with the same carbs. Don't tell them to take G2, the low carb version, okay? You need them to take the regular Gatorade. That's what I'm gonna tell you. You're gonna go to your institution, you're gonna talk to your endocrinologist, your anesthesiologist, you're gonna tell you he's crazy. Tom Barris is crazy. I'm not crazy. Our own experience is it works fine. And again, it will help them with that insulin resistance postoperatively, okay? It'll help to improve, weird, weird sounding, it helps to improve their glucose control postop. Pre acetaminophen, I mentioned to you that we have patients do something with pre acetaminophen. So our instructions at our institution are you take Gatorade, 12 ounces, four, you take it the night before, going, when you, before you go to bed for surgery, and then four hours before your scheduled surgical start time. At that four hour dose, we also tell them to take 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol or acetaminophen. What do people say about acetaminophen? It doesn't work. 
I take it and it doesn't work. All right? How many people say, you hear that all the time, it doesn't work. Why do they think it doesn't work? Because it's not instantaneous. You don't pop two pills and feel better. It takes time to enter the CSF. For a long time, people didn't understand how acetaminophen worked. I mean, just as a medical community, we didn't know the mechanism of action. We knew it worked, but we didn't know why. It has to enter the CSF, so it's got to go in through your digestive system, it's got to get into the bloodstream, it's got to get into the CSF. These things take time. So that's why we tell patients, take it ahead of time. Take it four hours before. It definitely reduces the amount of opioids patients need postoperatively. There is no arguing it. There's no question about it. You look at study after study. Patients who get scheduled acetaminophen, especially if you load them beforehand, they have a reduction in their opioid needs postoperatively. It has a favorable side effect profile. What's bad about Tylenol? Not a whole lot. So it works really well. This is a chart that I like to show people why we picked the four-hour time marker. The red is IV acetaminophen. Y'all are familiar with Ophirmov. Yellow is oral acetaminophen. The green is rectal. We're going to ignore that because rectal acetaminophen absorption is erratic. It's slow. And frankly, it's kind of unpleasant, right? Which, which one of your patients don't want to do things like drink bowel preps even? Who's going to want to? And by the way, I want you to take this. You want me to put it where? No. That's like I have. <laughs> Ophirmev works, people like it a lot because they feel like they give it and it works. It works really fast because look at the CSF levels. Look at how fast they, spe they spike. They come up really quick. This is why Ophirmev has this impression that it works better. At the four hour mark, you're starting to catch up a little bit with the oral here. Oral is like, what, 10 cents a dose? If I tell patients to take it at home, the cost of the facility or the healthcare system is zero. Ophirmev is $40 a dose. It's expensive. Okay, margins are thin. Pharmacy is trying to clamp down all the time on drug costs. If you tell them I want to give everybody a forty-dollar dose of medication, they're not going to—they're not going to go along with it. So we get the patients to load ahead of time. We don't have them show up and then give them the—you know—an hour before surgery and then give them their acetaminophen because at an hour mark, look where the CSF levels are. It's down here. I want it up here. So I get them started early at home. So day of surgery. We talked about it. We said we tell them four hours before surgery, drink your carbohydrate rinse drink. Puts them in that metabolically fed state we talked about. The glycogen stores in the liver are repleted. And then we can skip ahead to that for a second. We, we said 1,000 milligrams acetaminophen. ASA guidelines for NPO. Your anesthesiologists are going to potentially lose their minds. You want patients to drink before surgery. They have to be NPO after midnight. They have to be NPO after midnight. These are the most recent guidelines from the American Society of Anesthesiologists regarding NPO status. Okay? You can read this as, as well as I can. I love that they had to say these liquids should not include alcohol. How many times do I get the patient who says to me, vodka is a clear liquid, right? <laughs> Your anesthesiologists are going to, unless they're enlightened, maybe, they're, maybe I'm, 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 you know, selling my own specialty short a little bit, but I had to fight these fights. They're going to tell you, our patients are obese. They're going to aspirate. They're going to die. They will tell you this. Gastric emptying is not slowed in the obese. They taught me that they, that they aspirated it and they had slowed gastric emptying when I was in residency. It's not true. When you look at the studies, when you look at ultrasound studies of gastric volumes, look at CT scan studies of gastric volumes, Gastric emptying in the obese patient is not prolonged. Gastric emptying to liquids, okay, you have to stress this, is not slowed in the diabetic population. If you give them solids, it is. If you give them protein-based drinks before surgery, it is. If you give them clear carbohydrate-containing solutions, it is not. In fact, the clear solutions accelerate gastric emptying in most patients, okay? So your patients who are obese and diabetic are not going to aspirate and die because they drank Gatorade before surgery. <coughs> Additionally, notice that it's two hours. Okay? What do I tell patients? I tell patients four hours. Why do I tell them four hours? At our institution, our schedule is fluid. Things move up, things move down. 
I want, I knew that it, the best way for me to torpedo this whole effort is to have cases get delayed or canceled because patients drank when they were, you know, at the two hour mark and now I can't move them up. A surgeon had a cancellation, something got done early and I can't move your patient up because they drank two hours ago. So we said four hours. The other advantage is we're dealing with human beings. Human beings are fallible. We make mistakes, right? You will get the patient who drank it too late. I don't want them to show up, say I drank it an hour later than I should have, and now I have to delay things. If I tell them four hours, it still buys me two hours for them to mess it up. And we can still proceed on time. You, you look at how your institution functions though. Duke, where they did a lot of the work on this, they tell patients, drink your drink on your way to the hospital. Because for them, their pre-op process is two hours. It's not at my institution, it's, it, that wouldn't work. But they also don't have a problem with telling patients who mess up the timing, go home, you're canceled. I don't wanna do that. These patients have taken time out of their lives, they're there, they want to have their surgery, I want them to have their surgery, we all want them to have their surgery. So I don't wanna do that. So that's why we give them that two hour buffer and we say four hours NPO. So we'll move on intra-op. We'll, let's talk a little bit about what goes on during surgery. We're going to talk about goal-directed fluid therapy, or what I like to term euvolemic resuscitation. We're going to talk about multimodal analgesia. We'll talk about some infiltration techniques that are a little bit newer. Some of you may have heard of some of these things. And then post-op nausea vomiting management is going to be important. We talked a little bit about that already. So fluids. It's the Goldilocks strategy, right? Not too much. Not too little. When I was in training, everybody got five liters of fluid for everything. Why? Um, it's good for nausea and vomiting, supposedly. I don't think it is actually anymore. But at the time. And we thought they needed it. They have NPO. They were NPO, so they're dried out. Remember, what do we always say? Your kidneys are smarter than you. Just because you're NPO, it doesn't make you hypovolemic. I used to come to things like this and I would say, who gets up in the morning and drinks a liter of water? But there'd always be like two jokers who'd put their hands and say, I do that. So I stopped saying that. But the fact is most people don't, right? Because you're not that dehydrated. Your kidneys can conserve fluid. So you don't really need like tons and tons of fluid. The third space, these patients are third spacing, right? You might not hear this for your small surgeries, but for bigger surgeries, patients are third spacing. The third space does not exist. Stop trying to fill it. There is no third space. People always talk about that. Surgeons talk about it, anesthesiologists talk about it. There is no third space, okay? Did I make that clear? <laughs> this is a study where they looked at a number of different types of operations. You don't need to be able to see the exact stuff around here, but they looked at like colon surgery, they looked at rectal surgery, they looked at hip surgery and knee surgery. The important thing is look at the shape. See these V-shapes everywhere? This is too much fluid, this is too little fluid, this is euvolemic resuscitation, just giving them the right amount. And these are things like length of stay, total cost of care, which is supposed to reflect like complications. Every time you give patients too much fluid, they have complications. When you restrict their fluids, they have complications. So you wanna get it just right. Like I said, when I was in residency, we talked about everybody gets five liters of fluid, right? So, we, so people did some studies, they said, well that, what we call liberal, fluid administration, clearly it causes problems. Patients get edematous. You can get ileus because of bowel edema. You get increased wound infections because you get, dis, uh, you get a lot of extra fluid into the interstitial space and it causes those cells to not be able to get oxygen diffusing to them to feed them. And so you get wound breakdown. So we said, well, clearly that's not the right path. Let's, get, let's restrict fluid. Don't give them any fluid. Patients come in, you do a whole colon resection with like 500 cc's of fluid. Okay, big operations. So what did we find out? Patients had hypotension, they had AKIs, they got kidney injury because they were hypotensive because we fluid restricted them too much. Well, clearly that's not the right thing either. And that's where you get into this concept of euvolemic resuscitation. I want you to think about fluids as a drug. I don't want you to think about them as fluids because in medicine we have this terrible habit. We measure everything in milligrams, nanograms, right? We're really precise until it comes time to fluid. And what do we say? I don't know, give them a liter of fluid, see what happens. What else do we do that with in medicine? Look at the sodium load in a liter of saline, okay? It's nine grams. The big bag of ruffles is 2.1 grams for the whole thing. 
Would you tell patients to just go eat the big party size thing by your, have a party by yourself, eat some ruffles. <laughs> no, you would never do that. If somebody came in and said, I eat this, this is what I eat every evening, you would, you would lose your mind. But then we go and give them liters and liters and liters of this, which has four times the sodium. I know it's not actually translate exactly, right? Because you have blood loss and things like that. But the point is taken is that it is not a benign thing to administer large amounts of fluid to patients. Multimodal analgesia. What does this mean? This is a big thing in the literature right now. I think of it as making a stew. If you guys cook, if you make food, what do you do? You throw some stuff in, you throw a little of this, a little of that, and it comes out really good, right? If you put way too much of one thing, it's not going to be good. But you take a little bit of each of the things, you get all the good parts of it, and you come up with a good dinner and everybody eats it. Unless you're at my house, in which case i got the one kid who photosynthesizes because I've never seen him eat. I don't know how he grows. So we combine multiple classes of medications to reduce side effects while gaining the benefits of each class. I am not going to stand up here and talk to you about opioid-free because I don't believe in that. I know it's, it's in vogue right now. Medicine is like fashion. Hemlines go up, hemlines go down, pants get wide, they get narrow. It's the same thing. We go, you know, oh, you know, opioids, opioids, opioids. Don't give any opioids. That's not the way it should be. The answer almost always is in the middle, right? We got into trouble because we got into this mentality of what I call opioid monotherapy. Everybody gets a PCA, right? Why? It seemed like a good idea, right? It gives them relief. They don't have to wait on anybody. They can control their own thing, but it's not the right way. So what do we do? We give them scheduled acetaminophen at our institution. I have gabapentin here with a question mark. This is very, again, very fashionable. People talk about giving people gabapentin pre-op, giving it to them post-op. We've kind of gotten away from it for the reason of the side effects. We, had, we noticed in the total joint population, we were getting a lot of sedation and subjective dizziness. Patients were like, I can't stand up, I'm dizzy. It causes, actually for some people, really profound sedation. You will get young, healthy patients who get gabapentin, and you can barely rouse them in the pre-op area. It's not everybody, but it does it enough that we've kind of gotten away from it as a routine. It's in the literature. It does seem to help with pain scores and reducing opioids, but I'm not sure it's worth the side effect profile. At our institution, at least for the total joints, when we got rid of it, we didn't see any change in our pain scores, and we didn't see any increase in our opioid use. So take it with a grain of salt, I guess, or a liter of saline, whatever. <laughs> Ketamine. I talked to you about Vogue, right? Things coming in and out of fashion. Ketamine's back in fashion again now. We used to, patients will call, you're not going to give me that horse tranquilizer, are you? Because that's, that's where it stems out of LSD and things like that. So it's a fencyclidine derivative. It provides really nice analgesia, not at the opioid receptor, so it doesn't have the respiratory depression. We worry about the bad trips, right? Then you get a bad trip if you get ketamine. We use really low doses of it, what we refer to as sub-anesthetic doses. Really has some nice benefits for patients when you use it at that low dose. Toradol, ketorolac, non, basically any non-steroidal. We like Toradol. You'll get people who want to give patients Celebrex pre-op. You can do that too. We find we get more analgesic kick out of the ketorolac, so that's why we like it. If the patients are going to be here, they're going to have an IV anyway. Let's give them the ketorolac because I think it works better. Tap blocks. People heard about tap blocks. You hear about this. You don't know what a tap is, but you know that you can block it apparently, whatever that is. TAP refers to transversus abdominis plane. Again, everything has to have a sexy acronym. You can't just say all that. What it does is it's the deposition of local anesthetic between the layers of muscle and the abdominal wall. So your abdominal wall, you have the external obliques, right? You have internal obliques, and I always forget. One of them goes this way, one of them goes that way. I don't remember. It's not important, though. And then you have the transversus abdominis, which is the, the innermost layer of musculature before you get into the peritoneum. All of the nerves that run to the abdominal wall are in between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. So what I do is I use an ultrasound to help me find this plane. I inject local anesthetic there, and it blocks the nerves to the abdominal wall. It does nothing for visceral pain. If you take out somebody's uterus, it's still going to hurt. But we're not talking about being able to fix all of their pain with one thing. We're talking about multimodal. It really works nicely for the abdominal wall discomfort, which is where a lot of people have most of their discomfort. 
So we do this, it helps with the abdominal wall pain. You give the other medications we talked about as well to help with visceral pain. And patients do really well. I was not a believer in this block. I was like, if it doesn't cover the visceral stuff, it don't work. When I trained, it was, if your block is not 100%, if it's not 100% comfortable after your block, your block has failed. But we also talk about that sometimes the things we learned when we were in training weren't necessarily right. Same thing here. It can cover part of their pain. It doesn't have to cover all of it, though. And, but it helps to reduce the amount of medications you need to cover the rest of their pain. So it's a really nice technique. It's not hard. You can talk to your anesthesiologist, and hopefully they can work with you on that one. So postoperatively, it is a big push to get patients back to eating and drinking normally. No more of this ice chips for a week, and then clear liquids, and then full liquids, and then soft diet. And of course, they're in the hospital for 10 days. How many things are you going to pick for them to eat before they can eat real food? Right? Patients will pick what they want to eat off of a general tray. If they are nauseated, they're not going to pick up the cheeseburger. You guys ever looked at what's on a clear liquid tray? It's crap. <laughs> it's like broth and juice. I just talked to you about surgery as a catabolic state. You're breaking down your proteins. Why would you take somebody who's breaking down their proteins and not give them protein? You have to give them fuel for the healing. So you want to emphasize eat normal and emphasize protein. Forget about calorie counts. Don't worry about the calorie counts. You want to emphasize the protein intake. That may mean supplementation. For like our colorectal cases, and now we're going to start doing it with our orthopedic, with our total joint cases, we are giving them protein supplements with their meals. They get general diet up front. I am pushing our colorectal surgeons to just go to straight general diet. I have succeeded in clear liquids day zero, and then day one general diet. But most places that are really serious about enhanced recovery after surgery, colorectal, you get, your, you get your colon surgery done, you are on general diet day zero. And it works. It's just really hard to convince people because they've done it a certain way for a long time. But it works. So you want to get them eating and drinking back to normal. You want to put them on a multimodal pain regimen postoperatively. Okay? You, you don't want them, we'll talk about what, what you don't want to do, but you want to continue this multimodal concept. Get them up and moving. Don't sit in a chair don't, or don't lay in bed. You've got to be at least up in a chair. We tell patients, you cannot eat in the bed. You've got to eat in the chair. It forces them at least to get up to the chair. When you're laying down, your pulmonary mechanics are worse. You're not doing anything to help yourself. Okay, you get an obese patient or a patient with some sort of pulmonary pathology and you lay them flat, it's worse. You want them sitting up. It puts the diaphragm in an advantageous position. They breathe better. Their sats are better. There's less risk for consolidation of the lung afterwards. So get them sitting up. Ideally, get them walking. They should be up and walking and moving. Chewing gum. What is that all about? So the first time, this is years ago now, I had a surgeon tell me, Hey, Tom, listen, there's a study. They're talking about chewing gum preventing ileus. I listened to him, let him finish. I go, you're a nut. How does chewing gum have anything to do with anything? But then I went and I looked up the studies, and he was right. He's a nut still about other stuff, but he was right about the chewing gum. <laughs> when you chew gum, it stimulates intestinal motility. So we tell patients after abdominal surgery, and certainly for some of your stuff as well, where you guys have concerns about ileus, things like, you know, uh, prost robot prostatectomies we do, the cystectomies. You know, I know those are bigger cases, and maybe some of you do are involved, though some of you are not. Those patients do have some risk for ileus. We have them chewing gum for an hour at least three times a day. Dietary will bring them chewing gum. We tell them you can bring our chewing gum you want. I don't care. It helps. It helps along with the moving, but it's remarkable. It doesn't cost anything, and it helps to reduce their risk for ileus. There are certain medications out there that people talk about for stimulating gastric motility and, and intestinal motility. They're really expensive, right? We don't use them at my institution. There's another campus that does, that's, that we're connected with. They use it. Our outcomes are the same. Ours are maybe slightly better, but our costs are way down. And this is part of it. So what do I mean by multimodal analgesia at home? We talked about what we want you to do in the hospital, the schedule, the acetaminophen. We do things like ketamine intraoperatively. We talked about non-steroidals. Then it's time for patients to go home. What do we do? We give them a script of Norco 30 and say, hey, hit the road. Why does it stop at the hospital door? It doesn't need to, and in fact, it shouldn't. You want to continue that multimodal analgesic strategy when they go home. 
How you choose to do it is kind of up to you. There's no magic recipe to it. But the thing is, patients want this. Patients will come to you and say, I don't want to take a lot of narcotics. Help me. So don't just write them for some big script for Norco. Most of them don't need it. And it's contributing to that whole opioid crisis. I didn't believe this when I read it, because I didn't think that this was true. When, again, going back to that whole when I was your age and when I was in training and I rode my dinosaur to work every day, we used to think that you could not get addicted to narcotics in the acute post-operative period because you had pain and you were taking it for the pain. I was always taught and I had always learned that you got addicted when you stopped having pain but you kept taking it. And it's not true. 6% of patients who have surgery and get an opioid prescription will become chronic opioid users. That's a lot of people because we do a lot of surgeries in the U.S., right? So 6% of them. In addition, those who do not use all of their opioids, it sits in the medicine cabinet for their teenage kid or their teenage kid's knucklehead friend to find, and now those opioids are out in the community where they shouldn't be. These are controlled substances. I have to fill out sheets and sheets and sheets when I get narcotics for patients for surgery, and then we give people narcotics and we tell them, just stick it in your medicine cabinet, it's fine. Well, it's got a childproof cap on it, right? I'm sure that helps. It's a big deal. So anything that we can do to prevent the opioids from getting out into the community in the first place is helpful. So set realistic expectations for post-op pain. Make sure to tell patients, like we said at the beginning, you're going to hurt, you're going to be sore, we're going to help you. I like to tell patients, I'm not looking for you to be pain-free. I'm looking for functional. I want you to be able to get up, walk around, do your stuff. You're going to be sore, and that's okay. If you put it to them that way, they have a realistic expectation. I like milkshakes, apparently I went back to that slide. So what do we tell patients? Schedule the acetaminophen. Okay, we talked about that in the hospital. We continue that. Schedule non-steroidals. Non-steroidal du jour. Pick what you want. Do you want Celebrex? Do you want ibuprofen? Do you want naproxen? Sometimes naproxen is nice because it's Q12 hour dosing. It's easy for patients. It probably has the lowest cardiovascular risk factors because sometimes people will say to me, well, what about that whole study that had patients who receive non-steroidals have an increased risk for MI. They do, but it was really long-term uh, non-steroidals. In the acute period, seven days or so that you're doing it, I don't worry about it. You can do Celebrex. Celebrex not always covered necessarily by insurance companies. I frankly, I think ibuprofen and naproxen work just fine. But you guys can do as you wish. Ultram. Ultram's great. It really works well for patients. We like to give them a course of, of tramadol. It's, you know, it's one of these things, what is it? Is it an opioid? Is it not an opioid? It's kind of an opioid. You know, it's a little confusing. But the nice thing with tramadol is that it also has effects on, centrally on things like the norepinephrine receptors, which modulate pain. It doesn't cause a lot of respiratory depression. It doesn't have quite as many side effects as some of the other opioids. So we give them a short course of tramadol as well. And then a very short dose of low-dose opioids, okay? Just a couple days. It depends on the surgery, but as little as possible. One person, uh, a gynae oncologist from, gosh, I was out east, I think he was at Brigham and Women's. He said that he has the residents look at what was the use the patients, uh, use of narcotics patients had their last day of admission, multiply it by three, and that's what they go home with. So he goes, so we write sometimes prescriptions for like nine tablets, because they use three. So I said, three times three is nine. But that's his, the idea, is he's trying to make sure to cut down, is that the alarm that I'm talking too much? It is. Why did I say oxycodone on here? Because oxycodone, I want to divorce it from the acetaminophen. I don't want Norco, I don't want Percocet, because I want to be able to give them scheduled acetaminophen and the narcotic just as needed. So let's, we'll go fast. So in the beginning, implementation at my facility, we started with total joints. The total joint patients looked like hell. They got PCAs, they were there a week, they looked like hell, they really didn't do their therapy well. So we started an ERAS pathway there, and we had great success. Patients did better. We get patients leaving sometimes day one, day two, even day zero occasionally now. And just like when you have a good idea, you expand it. <laughs> By the way, those are not all my kids. I have way too much hair to have that many babies. <laughs> we started with total joints in ERAS, and then we expanded it to nine different pathways. And, and counting. I'm working with Guy. I need to start one there as well. How do you start? You need point persons. I put nursing coordinator first because you need a, someone to coordinate this stuff. Physicians, we're too busy. We're, we're, we're easily distracted by shiny objects. 
we can't, we're not going to be your best people to keep it organized. You need somebody who's going to keep the whole process organized. Anesthesiology has to be on board because it's a big change in practice. Obviously, you need surgeons on board. Not all your surgeons are going to be on board up front. Pick, forget the ones who aren't interested. Pick somebody who's interested. Work with them. And they will show the results to the guys who are the naysayers or the men and women who are naysayers. And they will help you. Get your primary cares involved. Make sure they understand what you're doing. That you're optimizing patients. That you're giving diabetics Gatorade. Things like that. Because they need to be on the same message. They need to know the message. Everybody in the office needs to have the same consistent message. If you have one person who's telling patients something different, they're going to latch on to that. There was a place where they were doing outpatient total joints, and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't get the patients to leave all of a sudden. Patients were, were staying instead of leaving. They figured out there was a valet who was taking the cars. What are you here for? I'm in my joint replacement. Oh, I'll see you in a week. And all of a sudden, patients want to stay a week because the freaking valet said something. <laughs> Everybody needs to be on message. Okay? IT, totally underappreciated. You're going to need order sets. You're going to need data collection. IT, I'm going to tell you right now, IT works on a different schedule than we do. Their sense of urgency is totally different. Okay, my forgiveness to any IT people, please. <laughs> so get them involved. You need them. All of this is to tell you, I want you to break out of your silo. Stop thinking about, I did my part, somebody else got to do their part now. I did my part. Don't be in your own silo because it doesn't work. But this isn't a lecture about farms. I said I'm a car guy. Where's the car guy? Where's the car guy pictures? <laughs> you hosed me. Where's the car guy pictures? <laughs> All right, so who knows what a Pontiac Aztec is? Who watched Breaking Bad? I don't care what the kids who watch Breaking Bad say, a Pontiac Aztec is a terrible car. Okay, it's ugly. Oh, I'm so bummed. No, it's not even there. It is the car from Breaking Bad. But it's a hideous car, and it was designed in silos, okay? People just came up with stuff. They hit all of their targets that they needed to hit, according to General Motors, and put it together, and it turned out looking awful. So then the next picture was supposed to be the 2020 Corvette, the CA Corvette, which is absolutely revolutionary. Why is it revolutionary? It is the first time a Corvette does not have an engine in the front. The engine is behind the driver's, what's called a mid-engine car, and it's gorgeous. It is the stuff that little kid dreams are made of, my boys will drive one, I'm sure. I want to drive one. But the fact is, they took a different approach. They brought everybody to the table. They all talked about what their goals were, what they needed to do. And they came up with kind of a multimodal stew. And the car that comes out is this new Corvette. So go Google it and see the pictures of them both. And it came in at 60 grand, which the next competitor for that car is 160 grand, which is an Acura NSX. So you're coming in at, not that 60 is not a lot of money, but for the, the air that they're sort of floating in with that car, it's unbelievable that they were able to accomplish it. But they were able to accomplish it because they worked together from the get-go. Accounting, engineering, design, everybody sat at the table together. So parting thoughts, remember we said multidisciplinary, consistency. You need patients to move through the pathway the same as much as possible because then everybody knows, including the patients, knows what to expect. And it's a new philosophy and a new way of doing things. It's not same old stuff. We're not changing one thing at a time. This is my quote, because I had somebody who was giving me grief about making the changes. And I was trying to think of a nice way to put it. And thankfully, it was on email, so I had time to think and not start cussing. But this is what I told them. Okay? It's a new way of thinking and a new way of questioning the things we do. So with that, thank you. And we have three minutes for questions. Thank you. Questions? That's your homework is Google Pontiac Aztec and Google CA Corvette. Go ahead, please. I have a question about the block that you're mentioning. Sure. Um, and how long does that last? Like, what is the time frame for that? Is it like a week, two weeks? I work at your. So the question is tap blocks, how long do they last? And are a lot of people using them? They, you know, it's one of these things that depends, of course, on the local anesthetic you choose. We generally say in anesthesia these things last 24 hours. I don't think it's quite that long usually. Um, I think it's at least 12 to 16 hours. It depends on how much local you give, the, so the volume and the concentration. It's kind of a, it's a type of, lo of block where you need a large volume because you've got to get it to dissect along the muscle layers. So you're usually using 40 to 60 cc's 
you know, using a lot, and it's relatively dilute because of that, because it's a big volume. But it'll last them. It'll last them definitely through day zero, and then I'll, and if it's if if it's something where it's you know you're sort of protecting the abdominal musculature, you're helping that. That gets them through kind of a rough period that day zero, and they can get them home. And once they're home, they're usually a little bit better. And then you do all the multimodal stuff. Do you do that at the end of the day? Or do you do that? Depends. Um, I like to do it in the beginning because a little bit of anesthetic sparing. If it's a really long case, we'll do it at the end instead. But it, it does take a little time to set up. So if I can do it before, usually get the patients to sleep and then do it. And then it, it works really well for me, especially for like a couple hour case. Please. So we are a, an independent private practice anesthesia group. We are approximately 50 people right now. 50? 50, 50 50, 50. And you cover all of the Chicago area? I wish. <laughs> no, we're, we're based out of Edward Hospital, and then we also have contracts at several ASCs in the area around it. When you go to anesthesia type conferences like this, you're on, you're I'm sure you have anesthesia ones. Are you well received? Uh, this is the first time I've ever done this, so I guess I don't know. I mean, are you selling what you do over people that have been sitting there for four years and still practice? You mean like trying to get anesthesiologists to change their minds? It's trying to change the minds of 50 people in our practice is not easy. So it took some time, and initially, actually, we, I took a subgroup of my partners and said, this is what we're going to do. I asked for volunteers. Surprisingly, the volunteers did not break out by age groups. I thought that I was going to get a bunch of younger people or newer in their careers saying, yes, I want to do that. In fact, if anything, I probably had more older people, kind of people in their late 50s, early 60s, who were towards the end of their careers a little bit, who were more interested in doing this. I, don't, I can't explain why. The middle-aged people, people my age, not interested for the most part. But what we showed them was the results. And then we had our surgeons asking for it. I want you to do what Tom Barris does. And then it sort of forces the issue. I am not above public shaming. So how long has this been around? When did the group get started? We started with total joints in probably 2014. And I think that the colorectal, we piloted it around 2016, 2017 maybe. So it's, been a, it's, it's a mature product, and it's out there in the literature now. You'll see it everywhere. It's not, it's not experimental. It's not whiz-bang, as one of my partners likes to call it. It's, this, is, this is an established cultural thing now, I think. That's why I, I didn't want to use the word physician champion, because it implies you have to convince people. You, most people